Welcome to the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. This series features current work from across the schools and departments of the University of Cambridge, reflecting the pioneering work and diverse interests of members of Cambridge Neuroscience. Cambridge Neuroscience is currently going through quite a detailed consultation process to develop six new themes for the research we do here. Each of the next 12 talks will come from one of the six new themes, two from each. For more info on the themes and the talks covered in this series, please follow the links below and follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro. So today we are really delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Ewan Smith. Ewan very kindly um, stepped in at last minute for Thora Caradottier, who we're supposed to give a talk today. And she will give a talk now on October the 12th. So do mark your diaries. And for those of you who had registered for her talk, the link will be the same. So Ewan, really nice to have you here. I, I work in the same department as Ewan. He is a reader in Nociception and he is also a, the deputy head of department of pharmacology. And he's also a fellow of Corpus Christi College. So for those of you who don't know, his group focuses on understanding the molecular basis of nociception using mice, naked mole rats, human tissue, as well as investigating the cancer resistant and healthy aging of naked mole rats. Ewan, we're delighted to have you here today and thank you so much for coming to speak with us. Over to you. Thank you, Dervla. Thanks for that introduction and thank you to everyone who's turned up to, to hear me speak about things. So uh, the title of the talk is Bedside to Bench and Back Again, A Path to Translational Pain Research with a Definite Question Mark. So what I want to try and do is link up some of the work we do in the lab primarily with rodents um, to what we're trying to do using human tissue and how those two might interrelate. And obviously this talk is part of the beyond the neuron theme that Cambridge Neuroscience is building. And so there will be at some point some of that uh, not just neuronal cells being the importance being spoken about. So um, as a sort of overview of what we'll be doing, I thought I'd first say what, what we do in the lab. Um, so the main focus is pain. Um, and in terms of that pain, uh, we look at how sensory neurons function health and disease. So this is me accidentally almost burning myself in the lab uh, a few years ago. Um, and then we also look a lot at um, receptor function. So you're just seeing here a particular GPCR internalizing over time. So we do sort of whole animal work as well as right down to the individual molecule. Now, today I'm not going to be talking about naked mole rats, um, but we do work on them. So this is my favorite naked mole rat video. This is not a dead animal. This is a very heavily pregnant queen who you're going to see struggling to get up. So for those of you that don't know, naked mole rats are eusocial. They live in large colonies, uh, about 100 animals max. Um, this is one of my queens called Cruella, who later this day gave birth to 26 pups. And you can see she's a bit of a large lump compared to the other animals and struggles to get around the colony. So mole rats are just amazing. I'm a little biased, perhaps, but they're highly resistant to cancer, don't really develop neurodegenerative conditions although they live for over 35 years and they've got lots of oddities to do with their pain um, system and how that functions um, but I'm not going to be talking about those today. Um, so to get some terminology out the way first, um, pain and nociception are not the same thing but I'll probably accidentally use them interchangeably. So the International Association for the Study of Pain has this wonderfully exciting committee called the Taxonomy Committee and they've recently redefined pain slightly um, and they've defined it as follows. So an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Really the key thing here is that it's an emotional as well as sensory experience. It's not just you going ouch. So we need to contrast pain with nociception, which is the neural process of encoding noxious stimuli. So the way to think about this is if you get up in the morning, you make a cup of coffee, it's too hot, you pick it up, you go ouch and put it down again. That was nociception. Your nerves encoded that heat stimulus and you reacted to protect yourself and you put it down. You don't walk away from that coffee cup being all depressed and anxious about ever touching a hot coffee cup again. By contrast, people who are living with chronic pain conditions, perhaps osteoarthritis, that pain, that nociception serves no function, really. So these people will quite often experience comorbidities such as depression and anxiety. If you're constantly living in a pain state, you're less likely to do things you enjoy doing. Things you do will be causing you pain. And because of this, people can become much more occlusive, less wanting to do things. And so that's why we find high levels of depression and anxiety amongst the chronic pain community.
So when we're working with rodents, as we primarily do, and we measure behavior, we'll talk about pain behaviors, but really what we're looking at is nociception, because I never know exactly what the mouse feels. We can talk about what a behavior may mean in terms of emotions, but we don't really know. So we study nociception, but I will be using the term pain because fundamentally chronic pain is what we're trying to target in humans. And of course, we hope that whatever we find out in rodents will translate to humans. And hopefully by using human tissue, we can increase the chances of that translation. So if I'm using rodents and working on nociception and pain, you might be thinking, well, ethically, that sounds horrific. Why would you do that? We have painkillers. Um, so just to put some statistics out there, um, this is a meta-analysis of lots of different studies in the UK looking at the prevalence of chronic pain. You don't need to worry about the details. The key thing is where this dotted line comes down, which is about 43% of the adult population experience chronic pain at some point in their lifetime. So that's quite a lot of the population. About two thirds of people who are administered painkillers for their pain find they don't work. Either they cause side effects that are so bad, or they'd rather just, um, or, or they don't get rid of the pain itself. Um, and for the younger people out there, you may be thinking, well, 43% is a lot of people. And indeed, we do um, find that there is a relationship between age and pain. So um, this is just a range of studies looking at different age groups. The key part is the prevalence of chronic pain increases in all those studies as you get older. So something for us all to look forward to. So in terms of nociception, um, humans are by no means unique. Um, Darwin, as he often was, was pretty right when he said any variation, however slight, if it be in any degree profitable to an individual of any species, will tend to the preservation of that individual. And what you can see here um, is a range of species in the animal kingdom. And we've got things that don't really have nervous systems back here with sponge, for example. But everything in grey is an organism where nociceptors have been identified. So we've got C. elegans here, a hermaphrodite C. elegans has about 302 neurons, and 24 or so of those are nociceptors. So even a very basic organism which doesn't have a brain, so we probably wouldn't uh, infer that the, uh, the worm has emotions such as depression or anxiety associated with pain, perhaps it doesn't live long enough for those to develop, but it does definitely have nociception. The medicinal leech, a bit more of a complex animal, again, has specific nerves that function as nociceptors, as well as others that are functioning as touch receptors and so forth. And here we have uh, the rainbow trout, and there's a lot of debate in the field about whether fish feel pain, that being the emotional components, do they suffer? Um, I'm not going to get into that. We work with rodents, so I don't need to worry about it. But there's a huge debate um, in the literature and in the popular science media about how much there is between nociception and pain and suffering um, in fish. So if you want to go and do some extra reading, then that's something you could definitely spend a long time going down a few rabbit holes about. So all these species here in grey have nociceptors, so humans are not unusual in that. And although pain may seem like an unpleasant thing, the fact we find nociception throughout so many species suggests that it does form an important detect and protect mechanism. And indeed, we can see that in humans when things go wrong. Um, so this is an image of a boy with congenital insensitivity to pain. And you can see here that he's lacking most of his digits, he's got an ulcerated left knee, and he's standing only with the support of this ladder. So congenital insensitivity to pain, genetic disorder, which results in an inability to feel painful things. And there are numerous reasons for this. Um, some result in an anatomical lack of those sensory nerves enable you to feel noxious stimuli. So for example, NTRAC1 and PRDM12 are two genes associated with the development of the nervous system. And these people with mutations in that system anatomically do not have those nerves that function as nociceptors, nerves that detect noxious stimuli. There are other mutations though, for example, this one here in a voltage-gated sodium channel subunits where there's no anatomical abnormality or no gross abnormality, but there is a difference in how those neurons are working. And to give you an example of how devastating this condition is, there's a clinical uh, colleague of mine in Oxford who has a patient now in his late 20s, and he tells the story that, you know, that when this um, child, when this person was in a toddler, like most toddlers, he had toddler tantrums and argued with his parents. Um, but unlike most toddlers, he was able to win any argument because he would just break his finger bones. That was a very quick way of stopping his parents arguing with him. And of course, we have to bear in mind that uh, if you don't feel pain, then breaking your bones isn't going to cause you a problem. Understandably, he now has slightly malformed fingers as an adult. So it really is a complete and utter absence of the ability to feel pain. This results in injury, quite often results in infection, resulting in amputations, as in the case here, or people may injure themselves and cause a, a life-threatening injury. So people tend to die at a younger age, but not always. So although pain may seem an unpleasant thing, we're much better off having nociception to detect and protect us. 
So in terms of what I want to talk about in particular, I'll give a very brief introduction to the sensory nervous system. I'm going to spend most of the time talking about drivers of knee joint pain, and then I'll spend a much shorter time talking about two other stories, looking at colonic sensory neurons, and we'll end with talking a bit about labor pain. So broadly speaking, um, the sensory nervous system in a textbook works like this. Um, you have an, an end organ, in this case, the skin with some hair sticking out of it. And there are two main sorts of sensory nerves that innovate these end organs. Mechanoreceptors that come in different types, but primarily are involved in the sensation of touch. So there are different forms of these that can detect, for example, some are involved in vibration, some in indentation. So they function in different ways. Nociceptors are those sensory nerves that are tuned to detect noxious stimuli. And they innovate very densely the skin because the skin is the organ that's going to come into contact first with most damaging stimuli. And if you think about that, that makes sense. If you get a pain in your muscle, your muscle aches, but you can't pinpoint the exact location, whereas your skin, you know exactly where that danger is coming from, which is good because that means you can quickly uh, remove yourself, hopefully, from the source of that stimulation. So the cell bodies for all of these sensory neurons, at least for below the head and neck, are located in the dorsal root ganglia. And these essentially form two strings of pearls either side of your spinal cord and send off sensory neurons to that part of the body. And because it's particularly difficult to measure the properties of sensory neurons at their ending, we're very lucky that we can isolate individual dorsal ganglion neurons in culture and we can use these as a model of the nerve ending because the cell body has to make proteins that are then transported towards nerve ending, enabling it to, for example, detect heat. So we can identify within these cell bodies heat-gated ion channels. And we assume that what we measure here mirrors what happens in the periphery. But of course, there will always be differences, but it does give us a good model. So if you activate a sensory neuron, the signal will fly off the spinal cord. Uh, some signals do go up to straight up the brain, but it's only a few percent. The vast majority enter a, an, in, a, um, an interneuron network circuitry that is quite poorly understood. Uh, Andrew Todd's group in Glasgow have done a huge amount of work trying to identify the different subpopulations, but I think it's a little bit of a mystery as to what most of this uh, CNS processing is, is all on about. So in my lab, we take the easy step and we say, well, look, if you go to the dentist and they're going to rip a tooth out, before they do that, they're going to give you a local anaesthetic, hopefully. And local anaesthetics work uh, by blocking voltage-gated sodium channels, which essentially is just blocking the ability of these sensory nerves to send any signal. And then you don't feel pain. So the idea is if you've blocked pain at its source by blocking the nociceptor, you don't need to worry about the complicated bits. Now that's a very simplistic view. Clearly in chronic pain conditions, all sorts of plastic changes will have happened within the spinal cord and within the brain. And so perhaps changing and blocking nociceptor function won't alleviate the pain to the same extent as in an acute pain situation. But it's a starting point. Blocking pain at its source has been shown to work quite effectively. If you give uh, local anesthetic injections interarticularly for arthritis patients, for example, you can at least temporarily relieve them of their pain. So in my lab, we tend to focus on understanding what happens out in the periphery and can we identify new drug targets and how do those neurons change? How does their environment change during disease? Now, the thing is, um, there are numerous approaches to studying these sensory neurons, and lots of them are polymodal. So that means they can respond to, say, heat, mechanical stimuli, cold, um, acid, all sorts of things. Others are, multimodal, others are multimodal, only responding to fewer of those stimuli. But the big question we always ask in the lab is, well, which, which neurons are you talking about? If we're interested in joint pain, surely we want to study those neurons that innovate the joint rather than random neurons, because we would expect neurons innovating muscle or skin or joints to have different properties. So that's going to move me on to the, the bulk of my talk, which is to talk about drivers of knee joint pain. And the majority of this work was led by Sam Trakabati, a PhD student in the lab who, who left a year or so ago pre-COVID and is now a postdoc in Berlin and ably supported by others whose names will appear as we get to their work. So, as I just said, we're interested in neurons that innovate specific organ systems. So arthritic pain is by definition, generated in the joints. So if we want to study those, uh, what happens in a painful condition of the joints, we need to identify those neurons. So the way we do that is we take our mouse and we inject a retrograde tracer into the knee. This then traffics back to the dorsal root ganglia and will identify cell bodies that innovate the knee, but nowhere else. And that's what you can see here. We're looking at a cross section under a bright field image with some axons coming in. And there are lots of cell bodies here. When we then uh, illuminate to stimulate the uh, retrograde tracer fast blue, you can now see there are individual blue cells and a lot of non-blue cells. 
So this enables us to like, isolate individual cells, for, for example, electrophysiology experiments, and study the function of knee innovating neurons and ignore all the others. So it gives a much better signal to noise as to understanding in a painful condition how those knee neurons are responding. And also it gives us an opportunity to potentially target those neurons to relieve pain at the site of injury, rather than getting all the systemic effects you would get if you give a painkiller systemically. So lots of the side effects of opioids, for example, are because of the non-pain effects. So if we want to use models of inflammation, um, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis are complex pathologies, and there are good models, bad models, um, and some of them take a very long time for the model to develop because they're making it because they're a more complex pathology. What we quite often use in the lab is a model of inflammation that is very acute, but at least enables us to understand what happens in those early stages. So after a week following the, uh, the fast blue tracer injection, we can inject, for example, complete Freund's adjuvant, which produces a localized inflammation. So it doesn't, um, of course, bring about any of these say, autoimmune effects that you would get in rheumatoid arthritis, nor does it induce any of the uh, joint destabilizing effects we observe in osteoarthritis, but it does generate a localized inflammation. So this is what you can see here. We've got a mouse where only one knee has been injected. We've shaved the fur away to make this clearer, and we get inflammation of the knee joint, as shown here. So the knee joint increases within 24 hours. It's a localized injection. We don't get any systemic inflammation of the contralateral knee. So Sam and Luke in the lab um, developed a new uh, behavioral assay for this, looking what other people had done. Well, we wanted to look at spontaneous pain. So if you were in pain, you will be less physically active. You don't like doing as much. And there was evidence in the literature that this was also the case for mice. So our experimental timeline was just shown here. The animals get put in one of these chambers, which is all nice and clean. They explore, they dig for a few minutes, um, and then we give them fast blue. And then we measure their digging again. And then later they get CFA and we measure their digging again. So what you're looking at here is the end of a three minute period. This mouse has been digging for almost three, uh, almost a minute of that time after fast blue. This is CFA injected mouse that hasn't really done anything. So if we quantify that, we can see the digging duration is not affected by fast blue. So the retrograde tracer is largely inert. Whereas CFA, we get a big decrease in the amount of time spent digging, which we infer is because these animals are in pain and therefore want to dig less. And I'll show some evidence perhaps that later on. We also get a decrease in the number of burrows that those animals dig during that time. So because we've used fast blue to retrograde trace those neurons, we can then look at how the behavior of those neurons changes in inflammation. So here's an electrophysiology setup. Here's a non-labeled cell. Here is a knee innovating fast blue labeled cell. We can record from those neurons and we can measure the action potential threshold. That gives us an idea of how excitable that neuron is. And the neurons isolated from the CFA injected side require less current to make them fire an action potential. So they become hyper excitable. We can also measure their responses to different stimuli. And what we're looking at here is the response to capsaicin, a substance that activates the trip V1 ion channel, which is also activated by heat. Heat activates multiple ion channels so as a messy stimulus to work with, whereas capsaicin only activates trip V1. And we can see we have a higher percentage of neurons on the CFA side that now respond to this agonist. Now, the problem is, of course, you can always say, well, hang on here, you've had to kill the animal, isolate these individual neurons using enzymes or a dish, you're sticking an electrode in them. Can we really read anything into the relevance of these results? And so at least in terms of the capsaicin uh, frequency of response, we can use immunohistochemistry on BRG that have been excised and immediately fixed. So therefore, there's no time for protein changes, uh, sorry, protein expression changes to occur. So we can count up our fast blue cells, our knee innovating cells, and we can count how many of those are expressing TRIP-V1. And again, like with the electrophysiology, we see a higher percentage of knee neurons expressing TRIP-V1 after CFA. By contrast, the receptor for nerve growth factor, track A, uh, doesn't show any change in expression. Binding of NGF2 track A has been shown to modulate TRIP-V1, increase its expression. And interestingly, 24 hours later, we see an increase in this co-expression. So it could be that this increase we're seeing here in the TRIP-V1 expression is driven by NGF, but we don't know for sure. So then in these animals, we've got um, a decrease in digging behavior. Those neurons become hyperexcitable and are expressing TRIP-V1 at a higher level. TRIP-1 is activated by heat, is activated by acidosis, is activated by a lot of different things, and it becomes sensitized by lots of different uh, signaling pathways. For example, bradykinin, prostaglandin E2, all act upon it. So TRIP-V1 is what we call a polymodal ion channel, and it's been shown to be critical for a lot of pain states. 
So we blocked trip V1 and measured the pain behavior. And what you can see here quite nicely is as I've shown you before, CFA causes a decrease in digging time. Half an hour after we've given the trip V1 antagonist systemically, we normalize that behavior, both in terms of digging duration and in terms of the number of burrows dug. Now this is really quite cool because this is happening within half an hour. So this isn't likely to be some centrally acting effect. It's more likely that we have blocked the trip V1 activity in those knee neurons where trip V1 is upregulated. Now there is some evidence that certain trip V1 antagonists cause hyperthermia and therefore might affect locomotor activity. And of course, digging you could say is a measure of locomotor activity. Uh, what I haven't shown you here, but you'll see later on is that the ability, for example, for these mice to run on a rotor rod isn't really affected by CFA. So it's not just a locomotor effect. Importantly, mice have not received CFA, they've just been injected with saline, the antagonist doesn't do anything. So this really does seem to be an effect about blocking trip V1, and within 30 minutes, it probably is due to a block of those sensory nerves. So we wanted then to look more at what happens in real pathological situations by looking at stimuli that might be relevant in a disease state. Um, so we collaborated with Deepak Jado at the uh, rheumatology unit at Adambrooks, uh, who was able to obtain samples of synovial fluid from people with osteoarthritis. And we know this contains inflammatory mediators such as nerve growth factor, which has been targeted uh, in clinical trials for pain relief in OA. And we thought this might provide a way for us to identify other disease mediators, um, because obviously you want a battery of different things you can potentially treat your patients with rather than just one particular drug. So again, Sam led the way and we did this in collaboration with Deepak and David. So what we did is we took the synovial fluid from patients, um, we had our retrograde labeled knee neurons from mice, and we incubated overnight with a one in 10 dilution at synovial fluid, which sort of mimics what's gonna happen in the joint when you have these neurons sitting there and they're being incubated constantly in this synovial fluid whose properties may have changed in osteoarthritis. We then conduct electrophysiology to look at the properties of those neurons, and we also conducted calcium imaging, but I'm not gonna show you that data here. So what we immediately saw was that neurons that are sitting in normal medium that the cells are happy in, compared to those in the OA synovial fluid, we get this decrease in the action potential threshold. So less current needs to be injected to drive an action potential in neurons incubated with synovial fluid from OA patients. Now that looks nice, but of course you could say, well, hang on, this is just medium and now you've thrown some synovial fluid at it, there'll be all sorts of things in there. So of course what we needed to do is also have a comparison with healthy synovial fluid, i.e. synovial fluid from patients without any known joint disease. So that's what we're able to do. We're now comparing the resting membrane potential, that sort of basal state of how excitable a cell is for control media, control synovial fluid, and OA synovial fluid. And you can see we get this depolarization of the resting membrane potential for neurons incubated in that OASF. In addition, as I've just shown you, we saw a decrease in the actual potential threshold for neurons incubated in OASF, but not in those sitting in control SF. So this looks like there's something specific about the osteoarthritic synovial fluid that is causing this sensitization and this hyperexcitability. So we've looked at trying to move this in vivo now. So Becky Rickman and uh, another PhD student in the lab with Luke have developed a model where we, again, we use the retrograde tracer, but we now inject that synovial fluid into the knee joints rather than CFA to inject a substance that we know causes pain in humans, can sensitize neurons, can we get a behavioral readout? And this is still very much early days. Um, we've then got the same sort of training diagram as I've shown you previously, but now we're also conducting dynamic weight bearing. Again, if an animal is in uh, pain and injured in one limb, we'll put less weight on that, just like humans with osteoarthritis do. So we get swelling specifically to the OASF compared to the control SF. So that's a human substance where you get only prolonged swelling in the OASF. But we see no change in rotor rod behavior. Um, we see no change in digging behavior. And we see no changes in dynamic weight bearing. So this is a bit frustrating. We'd hoped that having caught, seen this substance can cause sensitization, that it would cause something in vivo. And although we see swelling at the moment, we don't see changes in at least these measures of spontaneous pain behavior. So what Becky's currently looking at is using pressure application measurements, whereby you've got an evoked pain measurement of the knee joint. So this is ongoing work, um, and we've now got access to many more synovial fluid samples through collaboration with Simon Jones in Birmingham. We're hoping to expand this up a bit, because ideally we'd want to correlate that in vitro work with an in vivo phenotype. Now, of course, one really wants to know what's in that synovial fluid. So I wrote what I thought was quite a nice grant, as one tends to think when one writes a grant, um, but the MRC didn't think it was so nice and decided not to fund it. So this is ongoing uh, work to try and find out what these mediators are. 
Um, there are multiple omics studies and analyses of synovial fluid, which have pointed to a plethora of mediators, including, as I said, NGF, which is being targeted already in clinical trials. But the weird thing is that lots of cytokines are regulated in rheumatoid arthritis, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha. Um, these are targeted in RA therapeutically successfully. If you target them in osteoarthritis, even though they're upregulated, they appear to have limited effect. So there's clearly a lot of work to try and find out what might be useful, usefully targeted to relieve pain in OA. As I said, those drugs don't work. So we need to understand more about pain mechanisms. Um, and on top of that, it's, you know, it's just complicated. We've got our RA joint and a zoom in on the joint, what happens to it, and all these different cells and mediators. And this is the OA joint. There are clearly lots of similar players, but there are also differences. And so what we're trying to understand now is what are those cell-cell interactions that are present and what is being released to cause that sensitization. And a cell type I want to tell you something about are the synovial fibroblasts present in both uh, RA and OA secreting mediators that are able to sensitize neurons. So uh, Luke and Sam in the lab have done some work on this where we isolated mm -hmm. fibroblast-like synovial sites from the uh, patella of the mouse knee joint. So that's these cells here growing in, uh, in a dish. You just put the knee, you put the patella in a dish and then cells just grow out. It's nice and straightforward. What they then did is they looked at the FLS that have been isolated from control mice versus those treated with CFA or healthy FLS that have been spiked with TNF-alpha that we know is present in the arthritic joint. And in the uh, CFA model, we saw limited changes in expression. Um, but with the TNF, we saw lots of things changing that we would imagine would be uh, being released by FLS based on other studies. So interleukin-6, for example, we get an increase in the amount being released by FLS when they're spiked with TNF. Now, the problem is, of course, this is a, a mouse situation where we've done this cytokine array, we measure the changes. Um, so it's really good to be able to team up um, with Fran Denk and Leonie Tams at King's because they had access to human synovial uh, fibroblast populations. And we repeated the experiments, focusing on a few key cytokines. And what was really nice is all of the cytokines that we saw upregulated in our mouse system, we also saw upregulated in those human fibroblasts. So again, we've got interleukin-6 going up, ker keratinocyte chemotractant, and so on and so forth. So it looks like the mouse is a good model for what happens if we take human tissue. So the question is, okay, well, if we've got those pro-inflammatory FLS, what happens if you co-culture those with neurons? Because again, that's what's happening in the joints. The neurons aren't sitting there on their own, they're interacting with other cell types and the mediators they release. So this is an image, a live cell image of FLS shown in pink and a neuron in blue. If we just patch onto those neurons and we measure what happens, we see we get spontaneous firing happening much more frequently in neurons with those pro-inflammatory FLS. Moreover, if we look at taking the media from those pro-inflammatory FLS and we put them onto the neurons, we drive a decrease in the resting membrane potential. Again, suggesting we're tipping those neurons towards being hyperexcitable. So it looks like this is a bit of an in vitro model of some of the elements of that arthritic joint. We've got the FLS that are acting in a pro-inflammatory manner. And when you combine them or you combine the media that they um, secrete with the neurons from the knee joint, we can drive hyperexcitability. Okay, so what have I shown you so far? I've shown you that knee innovating neurons become hyperexcitable during inflammation, that synovial fluid from individuals with arthritis and inflamed FLS both sensitize sensory neurons. So the question is, can we then control sensory neuron function to relieve pain during the inflammation? And for that, we had a, a big collaboration with Paul Heppenstor in Italy, who's worked a lot with viruses and several members from my lab, again, led by Sam. So adeno-associated viruses are, are great um, because they've got low pathogenicity, a negligible immune response, although having recently had my own AstraZeneca jab, I certainly did experience certain side effects. Um, but these have been uh, wiggled wig in the lab to uh, produce different capsid proteins have different tropism for different uh, cell types. Um, but there's a lot of problems with transducing DRG neurons from the knee. So a lot of work has been done in the brain targeting specific neurons using viral vectors. The issue is if you're injecting the knee, those viruses have to successfully transduce and travel back to the cell body, which even in a mouse is a long way away. And essentially, there's very few studies that have been done in the periphery. They primarily use AAVs injected intrathecally to, uh, um, to label the cell body. But then you've got no control over where those neurons project to. So working um, with, with Paul, Sam was able to identify that a particular AAV9 variant, AAV-PHPS, could transduce neurons from the periphery as efficiently 
as fast blue. So here we're looking at a DRG. Here's our M cherry staining for some virally labeled cells. We're looking at the four main ganglia that innervates the knee joint. That's your uh, AAV labeling, and that's the fast blue well-established tracer. So we could use this virus then to efficiently transduce neurons by injecting into the knee joint exactly the same as with fast blue. So what we then wanted to do is use these AAVs to carry cargoes to enable us to control those that knee joint function. So for those who aren't aware, there's this dread system which has en enabled you to uh, deliver GPCRs to different cells that have been mutated in a way to enable them to be activated by exogenous mediators. So broadly speaking, in a nociceptor, the M3 receptor is GQ coupled, ACH activates it, switch on the nociceptor, the M4 receptor is GI coupled, switches off the nociceptor. That's a simplification, but that's roughly how it works. So these GPCRs have been mutated such that they're no longer activated by acetylcholine. And the idea is that basically they have no activity. They're sitting there in the neuron, not doing anything. Of course, they're doing something. But for this purpose of this story, we can assume they're doing nothing. But then you inject compound 21, which doesn't activate anything that's present endogenously. It will bind to these receptors and activate the same signaling cascades. So these are designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs. Dreads. So we wanted to use this system to use an AAV to deliver the inhibitory dread to then try and switch off those knee neurons in an animal that's got knee inflammation to ask, can we control pain? So this is our DRG neuron. Here's the labeling. We're going to use these different tests again, the rotor rod, dynamic weight bearing, the digging. We've got our animal, whichever state it's in. We activate our chemogenetic activator, our compound 21, and we repeat the behavioral test. So again, this is a very acute application and measurement. First of all, though, we need to be sure that compound 21 doesn't do anything. The literature says it doesn't, but you always need to be sure. Um, and we looked at our digging test. Compound 21 did nothing, did nothing to weight bearing, did nothing to uh, the rotor rod test. So at least for these tests, compound 21 is definitely inert. So we do our CFA model again. We get knee inflammation. And now we're looking at the digging behavior. We've got all our animals expressing GI dread. Some have received vehicle. So we've got the pre-CFA digging. It decreases after CFA. 20 minutes after vehicle, it just continues to go down. Nothing really happens. By contrast, when we've got our animals with the GI dread and we inject compound 21 to activate that dread and switch off those knee innervating neurons, we normalize the pain behavior. So the digging goes down with CFA. Within 20 minutes, it goes back to normal, just like what I showed you earlier when we blocked trip V1. And similarly, we see a decrease in the number of burrows. So this was really cool because we think that you know, we're getting a change in pain behavior by controlling these neurons. Um, and that's what this digging results showed us. Um, the rotor rod, nothing changed. You don't get any change with the, with the CFA. And therefore, it's no surprise that switching off those neurons with GI dread doesn't do anything else. Um, a bit surprisingly, perhaps, nothing happened with the dynamic weight bearing. You get this change with CFA that was not relieved by vehicle, but also wasn't significantly relieved by compound 21. So this is probably relating to those neurons playing different roles. You obviously aren't um, managing to transduce every nociceptor. And what we really want to try and do in the future is have certain uh, capsid proteins which enable us to target neuron-specific popula populations. So you have a ligand that binds to a receptor and you know, okay, I'm only going to target this neuronal subset. So obviously we've injected compound 21 and we've got that change in the digging behavior. Why might that be? Well, we can do electrophysiology experiments because those viruses have M. cherry. So just like our fast blue retrograde tracer, we can identify them in culture. So here we've got our control neurons, our CFA neurons, and when we apply compound 21. So there's no change in the resting membrane potential. We switch off any spontaneous firing with compound 21, but in quite a cool way, the same as for that trip V1 study, CFA causes a decrease in action potential threshold, and this is reversed by compound 21. So we would suggest it's this normalization, the action potential threshold that underpins that normalization of the digging behavior. So to summarize this first part, which is the larger part, the other two stories I promise will be much shorter, we won't be going on till six o'clock. Uh, mice with knee inflammation dig less, uh, the knee neurons become hyper excitable, uh, you get a decrease in action potential threshold, they respond more to capsaicin. We can give a trip one antagonist to normalize digging within 30 minutes, showing that trip one is an important molecule in joint pain. Synovial fluid from humans causes hyperexcitability, and we can use uh, dreads to control knee neuron activity. And of course, this could be a pathway to gene therapy in arthritis, which would remove uh, the plethora of side effects, systemic treatments. So I want to tell you about two shorter stories, um, one about the gut and one about labor pain. Um, and Jim Hockley is a postdoc in the lab now at GSK, who is important for both of these studies taking place, in particular the colonic sensory neurons.
So by way of introduction, uh, the gut is big and complicated. It has two main nerves innervating it. The lumbar splanchnic goes to the distal colon, the pelvic to the, uh, to the uh, rectal colon, uh, colorectal region. Um, so the lumbar splanchnic nerve goes to the thoracolumbar region, th that's the, those are the DRG, and the pelvic nerve goes to the lumbosacral region. That's important for what I'm going to show you in future slides time. So we all get pain from our gut, but there's a very poor understanding of the nerve subtypes involved compared to in the skin, which is basically just because it's been easier to study. And the distal colon is of particular importance because that's the main site of pain for a lot of people um, with irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease. So what Jim did is he used a retrograde tracer to inject into the colon. By, by removing the DRG in two subsets, we can then pick individual cells for each of those two nerve branches. And without going into detail, we could then perform single cell RNA sequencing on all those neurons. And the aim of this is to look by gene expression how similar different nerves are. Can we identify specific nerve populations? The idea being, if we've got nerve population X, which looks like it's nociceptive, could you target that with a drug to switch off pain without paralyzing the gut by switching off the mechanosensory neurons? But when going into this study, we didn't really know what the nerve populations in the gut were. So what you're looking at here is each cell against each cell, and it's by a gene similarity index. So if you're a cell here and you're against this cell and you're in red, that means you're very similar. So each of these red boxes represents neurons that are genetically, in terms of their transcriptome, very similar to each other. And we've got seven of them, some much bigger than others. Looking at this in another way, we can see that almost all of those thoracolumbar neurons in the lumbar splanchnic nerve are in five groups. Whereas the lumbar sacral neurons from the pelvic nerve a third of the neurons are in those groups, but two thirds are in completely different groups. And that's what you can see here. So this is the first big thing that, at least from a transcriptome point of view, the pelvic nerve is not the same as the lumbar splanchnic nerve. Now, I'm not gonna go into all the validation that we did with all of this using immunohistochemistry, calcium imaging, and so on and so forth. I'm just gonna tell you, we've got these seven populations and the big question is, okay, great. You've got all these different stimuli that come in. We've got these seven populations and we get different sensations. Can we match a population to a condition? So we could say, okay, you want to target this specific population to switch off this specific problem. And that's what you're after. We want targeted therapy. Can we bring that about by understanding transcriptomically what's going on? And I'm just going to give you one example of how I think this can uh, be beneficial, and that's related to irritable bowel syndrome, which affects about, you know, up to 10 million people in the UK. You get abdominal pain and disordered bowel movements that comes in different forms, sometimes with constipation, sometimes with diarrhea, sometimes mixed. So he teamed up with Nicholas Sanak at the University of Toulouse and David Bulmer, who is also in our department, and Nick had essentially identified that in patients with IBS-C, this arachidonic acid metabolites 5 oxoeat was specifically upregulated. So these people are in pain, this mediator is present in their biopsies and it's not present in the others. If you inject this substance into mice, you get no change in the gross morphology of the colon, which is important because irritable bowel syndrome, again, doesn't really have much inflammation, unlike inflammatory bowel disease. So no overt inflammation, but if you do colorectal distension in mice, just like in humans, you will hit pain at a certain, uh, certain um, inflation pressure. And what you can see here is the visceromotor response is much greater at all these pressures in animals that have received 5 oxoeats. So just like in humans with IBS, no inflammation, big change in your hypersensitivity of the gut. 5 oxoeats also activates DRG sensory neurons by using a calcium imaging platform. So you've got a mediator that activates sensory neurons in the gut and causes pain. So can we use our uh, transcriptomic platform here to identify which population is important to then say, okay, if we target that population, you bring about pain relief without compromising the functions of what the other nerve populations are doing. So through a lot of work, it was identified that the Merg PRD receptor is the receptor for 5 oxoid. So if you knock down Merg PRD, you switch off neurons responding. So Dave Hughes up in Glasgow, by luck, happens to have a Merg PRD GFP mouse. So Jim had a nice uh, jolly up to Glasgow to inject some mice um, to identify, okay, in those Merg PRD population, are they present in the gut? And you get quite a pretty picture to say, yes, they are. These are our fast blue labeled neurons. This is our GFP signal. If you count how many of those are co-localizing, saying, yes, Merg PRD is present in colon innovating neurons, you get about 7%. When we go back to our transcriptomic study, it's really quite cool because this very small population down here 
the non-peptidergic, that's what this NP stands for, that's the only population that expresses the MERV PRD receptor. So this, I think, gives a good example of a platform whereby you identify a disease mediator, we can use our neuronal subset map to identify the neuronal subset that's important. And now, of course, the next step is to say, OK, can we ablate that population's function, bring about pain relief in IBS models, perhaps in humans, without compromising what all of these different neurons are doing? Because certainly the PNF population, anything with an F is for neurofilament, lots of these are mechanosensory. And paralyzing the gut is the last thing you want to do in someone who's already experiencing constipation, as this particular patient subset are. So that's the point we're at to at the moment. It's going to be really exciting to see what happens if we perturb the function of those neurons in people with IBS or probably mouse models would be a good starting point. So RNA sequencing identifies, uh, of identified neurons enhances the power of data output. We've identified there are seven clonic sensory neuron subtypes, two being distinct to the pelvic nerve. And the MMP neurons mediate the abdominal pain in IBSC through this 5 oxo mediator, which is only upregulated in those patients. We still need to see what, of course, those other subsets do. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I want to move a bit further down the body and talk about a tale of painless delivery. Um, so this is a huge collaboration with lots of people up at Adam Brooks uh, and at CIMR, uh, led by Jeff Woods and Mike Lee. And basically what they're trying to do is identify new genetic variants um, by involved in pain by studying painless labor. So what they did across the UK was they looked for uh, people who reported no pain and didn't request analgesics during labor. Lots of inclusion and exclusion criteria are used. So yes, these people are otherwise healthy. Um, and then we looked at those people in more detail. So what I mean by more detail is quantitative, quantitative sensory testing was carried out by Mike using a control population shown in white and in black is the population that did not request analgesics, a subgroup of them. There are three red triangles. They represent a specific gene variant that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And essentially, there were some other changes we observed. So these people basically have less labor pain. They also had lowered cold pain threshold, higher heat pain threshold, and a massively higher pressure pain threshold. So it looks like it's not specific to labor pain, but actually these people have got a variance perhaps in them that's leading to a heightened pain threshold. And those three red triangles represent people who had the same variation in KCNG4. So there were heterozygotes. Um, you would expect, uh, uh, based on the numbers we had, you'd expect about 1.1 people to have that uh, variation. We had four. So it's overrepresented in this patient population. And this is just showing you where that mutation is in the, select, in the selectivity filter. And all of the other, uh, virtually all of the other human um, KC, uh, KV channels have this and lots of other species. So it's clearly a very important uh, residue. The KV6.4 is a bit boring at first glance. It's a silent subunit. That means if you express it on its own in cells, you will not measure a voltage-gated potassium channel current because it doesn't do anything. What it does do is it forms heteromers with other voltage-gated potassium channels and modifies their biophysical properties. Now, for people who don't like biophysics, panic ye not, because this is the easiest thing ever to witness. So Frank Ryman's lab looked at this using hex cells. Here's our KV2.1. We're measuring the amount of inactivation across a different voltage curve. These are homomers. You add in KV6.4, and that's a huge shift, a massive, massive shift. So what we can basically say is around the resting membrane potential of a cell, let's say minus 60 millivolts, KV2.1 on its own is not inactive. Virtually all the channel is there ready to open and, and keep that cell in a hyperpolarized state. By contrast, you throw in 2.1, and many more of those channels will be inactive at the resting membrane potential of a cell. What does our variant do? It looks like it's non-functional, because we no longer have this shift to the left. So if you have the variants we've identified in these women without pain, or with heightened pain thresholds, it looks like you've just got 2.1 there on its own. So what's going on? Well, firstly, importantly, those women were heterozygotes. And we can see if we put in the wild type and the variant version of this ion channel, we get a dominant negative effect. So this is the variant on its own. So this is the, uh, the variant on its own. And we get this shift. And we get the shift when we have the uh, heterozygote version. This is the, the valine, the, the, sort of the more common variant. So it works in a dominant negative fashion. How is it working? Well, it's stopping 2.1 getting to the cytoplasm. We've got the sodium potassium ATPase marking out our cell, uh, cell membranes. We've then got a, a, a tagged version of 6.4. And you can see the wild type version gets the plasma membrane. You can do a nice line scan and see that your red peaks, the sodium potassium ATPase, match the peaks of your 6.4. The variant we've identified does not get to the plasma membrane. You get a big lump of green staining in the middle. And the same is true if we put in both a common 
and our rare variant. So it looks like acts in a dominant negative fashion to prevent 6.4 modifying 2.1. So essentially any cell that's expressing 6.4 when you've got this variant will not actually be doing that. It will just be having 2.1 at the membrane. Importantly, in a mouse model, again, using our retrograde tracer, we can see in those single cells that we pick that we've got our 2.1 and 6.4 being co-expressed. So this is the 6.4. And again, with a uterus like the colon, it goes to two different regions of the spinal cord. And we can assume these are nociceptive like neurons by their expression of trip V1 and one particular voltage-gated sodium channel, NAV1.8. So I showed you that huge shift we observed in the cell lines. We also wanted to see if we could do that in vivo or in vitro in real neurons, which is more complicated because you've got lots of different potassium channels. Essentially, you can use a particular toxin to identify just the 2.1 current. We then overexpress either the common or the rare variant. And the common variant causes a shift in the inactivation threshold, the steady state inactivation, just like it did in the cell line, compared to our rare variant. Again, suggesting the rare variant just sits in the cytoplasm and no longer causes modification of 2.1. So how does that correspond with neuronal excitability? Well, more potassium function would mean that you've got to fight harder to excite a neuron to get an action potential. And Luke and Gerard did these experiments in the lab and found that to be the case. If they have a ramp of excitation and you measure the action potential threshold, how much current you need to drive an action potential, we see here that it's much lower in the, rare, in the common variants compared to our rare variants. So we've got much higher threshold for nociceptive firing when you've got this rare variant, which probably corresponds with those women having higher pain thresholds. Their nociceptors need more oomph to get a signal going. So in a cartoon fashion, how does that work? Here is our sort of common situation. You've got 6.4 modulating 2.1. That means you've not got so much uh, potassium current going on, so you can just give a bit of excitation, you drive pain. In our situation where 6.4 stays in the cytoplasm, we end up just with 2.1 at the membrane. 2.1, remember, has different steady state inactivation, which means around the rest of the membrane potentially have more potassium efflux. That means that these cells are far less excitable, hence that higher activation threshold, and hence these people have less pain. So to summarize then, we've got this variant of 6.4, which occurs in women who request no analgesics. It modulates 2.1, and it's expressed within the uterine sensory neurons. It itself is non-functional. We get a greater potassium current when this uh, rare variant is present, hypoexcitable sensory neurons, less pain. And now what we need to really discover is whether 6.4 represents a therapeutic target for analgesia generally, considering the women had much wider uh, changes in pain threshold, it wasn't restricted to just labor pain. So I've witted on long enough. Uh, this is a group pre-COVID. Uh, main people I've spoken about here were, were Sam and Gerard and, and Jim, who've since left the lab, ably supported by Luke on Beck in many of those experiments. Uh, lots of collaborators here in Cambridge and elsewhere, uh, especially Jeff Woods and Mike Lee up at uh, Adam Brooks, who've been a, a big help with all our human, uh, human work. Um, and also, of course, thank you very much to everyone who's funded our, our research over the years. Um, now, of course, we're doing everything on Zoom and things have changed a little bit. Um, but yes, it's the same team doing good stuff. And I'll stop there and happily take any questions if people have any. Thank you, Ewan, for that jam-packed and fascinating talk. Join us next week when we welcome Professor Zoe Kortzi. Zoe is the Biological Co-Director of Cambridge Neuroscience and a Professor of Experimental Psychology here at the Department of Psychology in Cambridge. Her work aims to understand the role of learning and experience in enabling humans of all ages to translate sensory experience into complex decisions and adaptive behaviours. She will be speaking to us on AI-guided solutions for early detection of neurodegenerative disorders. For more info on this seminar series and all things neuro-related here in Cambridge, follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro and follow the links below. See you next time.